Massimo Yama. He is the one of the uh, lecturers at the uh, USB program in Alta University. And my first impressions, as I remember Timo with his uh, slide of the Darth Vader uh, <laughs> through the studio. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but he is uh, one of the um, um, owners of the startup company who is uh, doing the design with the, or urban design and planning with the digital data. So he's an expert on all those GIS geeky uh, data sets. So if you will have any questions uh, from the professional side, from the technological side, that's the person to address all your questions to. And as well, uh, I would like to say that we have quite a lot of students from the GIS study studies. So I think they will be very much interested in all of your presentations. So handing over to you, Tim. Thank you, <laughs> Scott. It's, it's, it's nice to be titled. Uh, uh, kind of a geek. <laughs> well, we're all geeks, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a. I, I meant that in a positive way. Yes. <laughs> I share my browser window here. Okay. Uh, I think you can see it. Yes. Yes. All right. So, um, as we saw from the last presentation and there are a lot of issues related to more detail level development under the umbrella of, of, of smartness and sustainability. Uh, and I, I, I will talk about the another end of the scale, not probably the far end. I don't know if the, if the planning is right word, probably urban design can suit to the to the scope as well. And I try to kind of uh, elaborate a, a city science approach to the basics. And I will explain what basics mean then. And uh, I'm an architect, like uh, uh, I put here as a seasoned urban planner, meaning that I've been acting as an urban planner for 20 years already, in, in mainly in Finland and, and Nordic countries and, and some of the projects abroad also. But now I'm not talking about my projects. I try to practice and keep my new hat on, which is this PhD student hat. I just started to do to, to my PhD to do it uh, last autumn. And uh, how do I move this? Oh, here. And I, I, I started to <clears throat> do the research on very basic issue called land use, land use density, urban density. And I, my approach is I, I will prepare these kind of data papers, which are actually online. So if you just, just manage to, to find it from those links uh, under the GitHub, Page, you can play around with these as you like. They are not probably the best user experience yet, but anyway, the, the, my, my approach is kind of an opposite way that usually when you do the research, you play around with data on your computer. And then when you have the results, then you write the paper, then you kind of uh, publish the data and all those uh, research data management issues, but I, I have a, this kind of opposite way of doing and uh, using the open data sources, uh, mainly also for the Finland, but also testing this open, uh, open street map, how it can be used for this kind of purposes. And also when I started this, I, I, I have a new kind of a company. I try to create a consultation project Pro, uh, products and services out of these, these issues. And, and, and uh, let's see how it will go. But the, the kind of main point is to combine understanding of urban planning with 
the understanding of city science, which is usually coming from the, from the academia side, and also the practical level data analytics. Usually all these three are not within the same people or their heads or they or they within their skill sets or the companies and, and, and not even those big multidisciplinary companies. There are different departments for these, these skills. So let's go on to the topic. Uh, smart cities, I, I took this uh, the spawn, our sponsor, the European Union, and, the, and they have a site for the smart city. And, and if we take that perspective and try to spot the words which are commonly used and how it is understood, there is this efficiency term quite much used, management and efficiency, more efficient something twice mentioned here in the, in the very first paragraph. And that's very understandable. Efficiency is, is very kind of a very much used term in land use planning also and city development during the history. And, and that's, that's how it's under the scope of so-called basics, of course, depending on the on the context and the environment the basic basics in planning may refer to something else if you are dealing with the areas which are not so under the pressure of development degrowth and issues like this this but if we talk about the cities especially big cities it's about efficiency so they say that the cities are using technology to improve efficiency and then it comes to the, we have to kind of elaborate that efficiency of what? And also technology for what? And these kind of teams, they will spread out for the multiple direction, depending on your, your professionalism, your background, interest, and the topic, and, and all of those. And also the technology used and for what it is used, it's also spreading a lot of a different direction. Uh, there is a term or a kind of a concept called city science, which try to wrap up all these kind of uh, issues using technology to improve kind of cities and efficiency is, is very much also involved with in that scape. So, I will, I will dig in these issues and try to give you a kind of perspective what kind of things are related to those. Not to go too technical, but first, what is city science? Um, it's a term coined by Professor Michael Paddy. Uh, there's an openly uh, free book which you can find uh, called Urban Informatics. I think there was 2,155 pages about urban informatics. So if you have hard time to get sleep, you can probably read that through. <laughs> uh, Batty has this kind of uh, interesting uh, argument that uh, physicalism is coming back in fashion or the kind of in need for the planning because of climate change issues. And, and what he, he means with physicalism that, that kind of an interest for the physical things, objects in a city, not so much about processes and communication like it has been during the years, what kind of planning process and how to communicate with the people and, and, and kind of a, uh, say, argues that uh, uh, Planners have forgot the physical environment and its impacts, and he want, we wish to bring that in the, into the table again using technology. So let's dig in. Efficiency of what? 
basically you can say that efficiency in urban design and planning means density. That's kind of for the basics. We're talking about the building based densities, like those of you who are, have probably experienced to be part of the processes in planning amount of cross floor area floor area ratio is very much in the questions and, and, and negotiations and and of course you can track density of apartments like in 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 a, in a british they are usually usually talking about the units and, and households more than actual people like in here in finland or in some other countries the population density is very much elaborated. Uh, within city science, the lower one part is very kind of hyped scope and new one, because now we have uh, access to certain data bases of, of, of uh, cellular phones and, and, and more precisely tracked uh, traffics and things like that. They are very interesting field of, of research at the moment, kind of a flow-based densities. Concepts like day, nighttime population, that in some places there are a lot of population at some point of the day and then not, which is a totally different thing than that kind of density, which is based on the buildings and the people who are living in those buildings. You can track social media happenings and, 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 and posts on maps and what does that tell and sort of kind of things. It's a scope of consumption kind of consumption of space. And with basics, I mean this traditional production of cross floor area, very architectural kind of <laughs> approach. So that, that's what I'm talking about today. Density of cross floor area, is it really smart? That's the question. And density is a commonly used concept, actually in planning and also just in, in urban studies. It is very dominating parameter in transport modeling also, and that way kind of determine the, the scale of our environment through the streets and, and, and roads and, and all those issues. But uh, despite this, this very predominant role and place in, in urban discourse, discourse, it is often misunderstood, uh, misused or even abused, like some of the scholars are arguing. It goes very hands-on level on technical things, how it is measured but still it is used very kind of commonly to compare things, even if they are not comparable through the density. And in addition, density acts as a key parameter in most of the impact assessments that are done within the planning. Like in, in, in traffic planning, that the, the, they're trying to minimize the traffic and kind of the, the race, the, the, the amount of food traffic and kind of more sustainable mode of transports. And all the measurements and, and, and forecasts are based on the actual density because that is the key parameter of what planning is producing for people, but people living inside those density, those cross floor areas. But is it smart? So I first, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, bring, bring the small history of this, that why it turned out to be so that dense density is smart or sustainable. And the, one of the key uh, research what, what, what was made already done in the 80s was by uh, Newman and Kenworthy, when they tracked the gasoline consumption of cities and compared that to the densities. And you have probably seen this kind of a graph that here you have a urban density on, 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 on X axis. And, and if it is low, the density, the gasoline consumption is high, was in the 80s. And Hong Kong is here on the very dense part and, and very low gasoline consumption. 
So it was a kind of fight against the sprawl, the whole density uh, phenomenon. Uh, and at the same time, here on the right, uh, urban economists, namely the Glazer, the most, most probably cited urban economist, was studying the consumer city, meaning that tracking the density and the population growth and the amenity, amenity values, meaning that how many amenities, how much econ economical activity there are. And surprisingly, he spot out that if there is more dense city, then there are more value related to the amenities. And these two viewpoints was kind of combined even in a very kind of high level of, of guideline guidelining city development by you and happy that they principle two is called high density. They are saying that at least 15,000 people per square meter should be in order to it to be sustainable. That was 2014. So if we put that line on the map of the of the Newman and Kenworth, we see that only Hong Kong is kind of okay, others are bad. So it, it, there's something with this density which doesn't match or it is used very weird way. Here you can see that the lecture by which is this comparison is taken from, from her presentation, which you can find from, from YouTube, very, very nice elaboration on density. So Hong Kong, there was a quite high density in the, uh, in the 90s before they tore that down, this Kowloon city. The, the density was more than 100 times higher than Manhattan and, and it did turn out to be a problem. But according to the, to the density research, it should, should not be a problem, but they turn, decided to tore it down. So kind of very low density was seen as a high quality. So even if there is a tendency to treat density as a quality, it certainly not always is a quality. So there are something else than, than that actual number. And even if we are not talk about the qualities and we take this kind of a, a imp impact, um, climate change perspective, we actually still do not know if cities that have a higher densities use more or less energy or even time in movement than cities that have a lower densities. Michael Batty was putting that on the paper already 2009, but still it is very common understanding that, that densely built cities are more sustainable. You can find the link for that paper on, 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 the, on the link below when you get the slides. Uh, in Finland, there was a researcher, Jukka Heinonen, who studied this topic a bit further a few years ago when there was a much debate about the carbon footprint and how the land use development and land use planning is what kind of urban structure it creates and what is the carbon footprint. So it turned out to be so that high density areas, this is the metropolitan area of the Helsinki, there is a higher amount of carbon footprint per capita as on the lower densities. And all the, all the categories are going down when you go from high to low densities, even the, except the, the transport, which is remaining the same. So that kind of rhymes to the notions what Batty did, that there's something else behind this issue. One could even turn that opposite way, that it is good to develop low density areas for the globe. And we just don't know, but people seems to 
want to be close to each other. There are some other phenomena. So the question is, can city science help us to understand the density more smarter way? Um, that's kind of topic of my research. I try to continue this Berghausen's Bond and Berghaupt research, which they put in the book called Space Matrix. Recently, the newest version came out last year. So they tracked it more detail level. So here you can see graph all of these dots here, they are buildings. So if we put them on the scale like this, that, that, that there is a, a floor aeration, this typical density measurement, they are using this FSI floor space index. And on the X axis, there is a coverage, meaning that how much land that building is taking in the plot or whatever the, the scale is. GSI, kind of a ground space index for them. And then they took this kind of old concept, which was never uh, used more widely, but actually developed already in Germany uh, in the beginning uh, of last century, uh, OSR, open space ration which is tracking openness, meaning that how much open space there are for that amount of cross floor area. So it is a kind of, a, according to them, it's a kind of a measure of quality for people. That's a formula of it. And here you can see that the, some of the buildings are in, in that part of the graph and some in the lower part. And for example, like E mid-rise strip type buildings, they are here. And uh, high-rise point strip type building H, they are here. Meaning that, uh, for example, in Corbusier le Voisin, how do you pronounce it? Voisin, uh, uh, plan, high-rise buildings far from each other, a lot of openness but still the high, high, high density kind of way. So, so that's the... The modern period. Yeah. And we, like, you know, we have a lot of areas like that. So they try to kind of create a more sophisticated view on this, this issue called density, that what, what is this all about? And I continued that uh, here. Here is the one of the graph from Barcelona using this, my, my data papers, that on the, on, the, on the bottom, you see this plot OSR, plot openness. So it goes like this, that, that the most kind of densely built plots are here in Barcelona. There are a lot of those. And if you take some of the buildings, all these dots are buildings and take a look at the neighborhood meaning that calculate the same, same measurements, but not within the plot, but around it. They are still red on the same class, meaning that the environment is kind of, the urban structure is also dense and the plots are quite, quite dense. So it's a similar thing, but that structure was made quite a long time ago by, by Serda. So Today, the environment is different. If we take the same comparison from one of the modernistic uh, uh, areas uh, from uh, suburbs from, from Helsinki, you can see that the lower part is actually quite the same. There are dense, uh, kind of high density buildings. And if you take one of those and compare the neighborhood they have, they are kind of on the other end of the scale, very airy spread environment. So that's the point and, 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 and kind of uh, making it more sophisticated the actual calculation using city science based analytics, you can probably get a better view on 
or how it is impacting to, to for example, sustainable issues and, and also economical issues. Of course, we as a humans, we can clearly see the difference when we're watching the aerials, but with the data, it's, it might be a similar. So same amount of scrofal area or something else. And on the other hand, what we cannot see here as with the human eye is something which I try to figure out through the data. So technology, um, for what? I try to explain that I'm using that kind of analytical technology to dig into that density question that when it, when it is meaningful in what scale and what way calculated. But in general, in planning, there is a tendency to use technology for speed. This is one of the example of, I have blocked the name because I don't want to mock any companies here, but it's very kind of a, at least in Europe, we very much used the plugin for certain programs, which actually just calculates faster the amount of cross floor area, nothing else. Uh, they are using the same kind of words like in, 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 in European Union with the, city, uh, with the smart city concept that instantly, automatically, in real time, in seconds, generate cities. So is it, really, is it really needed that we are using technology to do things faster? Is that the main point in practice of planning? And another thing is quite related to that one, the automation. Usually automation is used to, to get things faster. And machine learning is the one of the uh, most uh, in interesting and, and scary concepts and, and technology developing at the moment and because it makes things so fast to kind of combining scientific principle of trial and error. They are, they are uh, statistically proved and, and very kind of smart, so smart that people just cannot handle them as quickly as those computers can. So if you are using machine learning to, to, to develop a solution for city and you only using density or cross flow area as a data which about a phenomenon that generates the data, meaning that city or development is the phenomenon and the data is only the density. That would probably lead to the same kind of situation as in, in Hong Kong with Koblon city. So you have to find something else which describes the phenomenon and the qualities as a data before going with these robots. They don't care. They, they don't have any values towards whether it is dense or not. Uh, Richard Sennett book called Craftsman, it's very, could 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 be read for those who are interesting about the the methods of how to how to plan and how, how to actually design or do the architecture using computers. And he, I take a few quotes here that um, he's elaborating the use of key CAD computer aided design to to do architectural design or planning that it is kind of uh, according to him making the end result uh, uh, usually the, 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 the end result is a lower quality than those designs which are made without CAD. Very interesting argument and it's based on that kind of this kind of idea that when you use pen and start planning, drawing counter lines and, and all those trees and, and section of the, of the site and 
it, it kind of while you are drawing it with your hand, meaning that there's a hand and your head connected, not computer and the site and the data, but your head and the hand, you understand the actual project and the idea much more deeply than just let the computer to generate the dinghy and then watching the screen. And that's very sure you have, a, I have tested it multiple times. So within the GIS and the analytics, there's a kind of similar issue that, that he's saying that when you show me the result, result, the computer understand the answer or the calculation probably. But I don't think you understand the answer. And, and that's very true. I have, I have a personal experience how it happens. And I'll try to show you that next, that even the small steps within the technology, the use of technology are very hard to get actually for humans, especially for clients. Let's not go there. So, this is a typical picture of one city. So the density is tracked here. So there's the city center. It's not a huge city. It's a mid-sized city in Finland. And you can probably see that, okay, there's the city center. It's a kind of a monocentric city and there are more dense people, are, more people are living there than on the outside. Very basic issue. Uh, these kind of maps are produced like a 50 years or more from the cities in the, within the planning. And, and now even still people are stick to this, that they're trying to figure out, okay, this, this cell is red. There are more people than here. So probably there are more buildings than there and this kind of thing. You kind of eventually start to understand. But if you change the perspective, the tracking the only small steps, you are tracking the chains of that particular cell, the what happened during the last 10 years, which of the cells went down, which went up by the counted by the population density. The whole picture changes, And already that small step change of a way of calculation or the kind of a perspective is very hard to understand. Okay, what this, what, what, what is happening here? What does that mean, this picture for that city region? Because they are very different. And when you go further, you take the kids, in which of the cells the kids changed. They, not, they are now more kids than they used to be. And these kind of small, small steps of the changing the parameters. And it's, it's already very hard to really get it and explain to the clients. Not to mention that if you combine this kind of a layer analytics and take a multiple issues, put them on the map and illustrate that. Here is the kind of a extreme example of all the data, different kind of workplaces, amenities, services, uh, jobs that empty circles are that there are less and filled in circles are that there are more. So the image of the city is totally different than it was with the just density calculation. And very hard to communicate. So uh, you can kind of, the Brit American language, they have this get it concept commonly used that do you really get it? And it's, it's really related to that. You may understand even the logic and, and the, what, what you see, but do you really get it? That's the, that's the kind of issue what I'm interested in. And, and I believe that you should do when you are more fluent with the technology. So to end up this, this <laughs> presentation, to really get it is important. So go slowly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, really interesting presentation. And I think showing exactly what the problems are and how 
sometimes even the professionals are illiterate to actually the data that you produce or if you use a little bit more intelligent uh, analytic tools and intelligent ways of the research it's you know you, you get lost them sometimes in the first sentence so that that's really a very interesting point that you have tackled okay do we have questions i hope i can answer <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure you will Okay, so then I'll crack the ice. Um, how, when you do the research, um, how is it difficult to really find the resources that do not contain any fake data? How fake can you data. trust the yeah? How can you trust the resource that it doesn't contain any fake data? That's a good question, and that's the one of the reason I'm applying this kind of Python language based automated GIS because usually. It takes a lot of time to, to, for example, the first notion with the OpenStreetMap data that probably it cannot be used for this kind of research very, uh, I have to figure out what is the level that it can be trust, but the, the OpenStreetMap is using these kind of tags for the buildings. So because it's outsourced the development, so people have tracked all that this building is, is tagged as a yes, because usually the open street map, if the building doesn't have a kind of precise tag, it is just yes. So it is a building. So I have a script that all kind of dog houses and small sheds are kind of excluded from the analytics, but still I'm kind of a, 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 have a hard time to figure out the, the, the kind of a logic or the, the method to to check that whether the DAG is actually relevant or not. Of course, OpenStreetMap, they have a certain kind of in-house quality protocols and measurements that they are fixing all, all those bigger errors within the time, but that's a good question. And, and for, the, for the another, for the more kind of quality data, which is the data produced by the cities of, for example, in, in Finland, it's it's not so big issue. And even though there are sometimes errors, but probably the, the well, yeah, that's a good question because depending on the type of the error, how it is, if the one of the building is that, that has a kind of a wrong floor number or something, of course, any machine cannot understand that. Okay, demo effect. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, so you have to kind of, that's why I'm trying to always do that, that it visualizes the, the, the thing immediately. So, because as a human, if you know the place, you can kind of easily spot out the, the errors, but of course, if you are studying a city which you have never been and or do not live in, it's it's difficult. So there's a need to live the flexibility for any inaccuracy or some kind of defaulty in the data or mm. data set. So, yeah. But for the on this topic, it's not probably not so big issue because there are uh, the big big picture is the the whole idea that. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering because uh, during the pandemics there was uh, a big fuss about open space analysis and how many people uh, are using and the easiest way was to track through the hashtags, you know, for the people and, and as well um, the heat maps or the tracking GIS devices that the people are using with the different uh, gadgets or for running and everything else. So there was quite a lot of um, faulty data when, you know, people are not even there and they to support something or someone, they have hashtags yeah. and different things. And then at the same time, you get such a great numbers and you think like, really? But, you know, that doesn't correspond to actually what the real numbers of the population um, during the pandemics of the people is and all the other stuff. So it's, it's it is challenging. Very yeah very important question under the especially when you are applying up uh, machine learning models and all those kind of things and there has been already cases within the uh, uh, the insurance business when they are applying data of people 
to, to, to kind of decide that whether he or she is qualified for certain insurance. And then there is some weird error and nobody cannot even check it because it's kind of in the machine. So yeah. it's pretty scary issue that if we kind of uh, detach ourselves from the learning and give that learning and the all for the for the computers meaning machines then it's we cannot kind of fix things afterwards or at least it's very hard yeah and i probably would recommend to all of the students there's a great uh, youtube video about the kowloon it's the really extremely probably one of the best examples and one and the only example of what the city was just you know to get a brief history and understanding actually that this is the phenomenon i think the only one in the world that you can find and how there was life city within the block actually the density is the lives and what was happening within the Kowloon before it was knocked down it was fascinating to see the documentaries and it's quite short so maybe we will have a look at it during the workshop but it's just really the world is full of so interesting examples in terms of the densities, lives in the cities. And from construction side, I don't know how it was built even. It's, it, it looks so crazy. It's like Anne's <laughs> house. Yeah, so there's yeah. a lot of things to learn. And about this final picture, probably some of you know, but probably some don't. That uh, It's a flag designed by... Rem Kohlhaas for the European Union on 2001 and and he had this kind of a influence that this it's a called barcode flag so this barcode switch are machine readable so yeah. he, he kind of nicely invert that concept to, to, to the, as a flag which should be human readable I don't know if it is you might spot your familiar colors there they are not <laughs> Yeah, if you are from the EU countries, uh, but anyway, the, his his uh, uh, manifest was kind of that you okay. should keep your features, but still be part of the whole. <laughs> the big picture. Yeah. Do we have any questions for Tim from the students? Okay. So probably everyone is getting ready for the lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Timo, sure. very much. Best, and yeah. uh, we're looking forward to seeing you here in Vilnius. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. you. So let's have a break and uh, we will come back uh, probably in 10 minutes. So it will be uh, 25 past uh, past 11 and then we will have the professor uh, Zita Valle from the um, Porto Institute of Politecnico de Porto, Portugal, and she will be giving the presentation of, on the smart energy. So I'm not sure if he has already joined us. Yes, he did. So we'll give the floor to her after the break.
Hi, good morning. So I hope everyone will come back <laughs> in a couple of minutes um, for, from, from the break. And I can see quite a lot of participants are still hanging. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Zita Valle, who is an expert on the smart energy. And she is from the Porto um, Polytechnico University in Portugal and a part of the uh, Athena Alliance members. So we're really happy to see you here and to have you on our uh, lectures uh, on site and online. So we're looking forward to seeing. And please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I want to congratulate you for the organization of uh, this uh, workshop. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope it will be interesting for the participants. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Zita Val. I come from Polytechnic of Porto in Portugal. And I will uh, speak about energy. In fact, energy is a very, very important community. We cannot live without energy today. Without energy, we would not be able to be here, presenting, attending to the workshop. But even if we are not working remotely as today, um, we cannot pass one day without using energy. So that's economy, that's our social life, uh, that's our health. Everything is dependent on energy we use. And when it comes to energy communities, it's a different concept. And we can see that, in fact, communities can uh, make a much clever use of energy that they are doing today. So let's have some, um, some uh, insight in this area because I believe it can be uh, quite uh, clear for everybody, even if you are usually working in the different areas. I would like uh, to begin with uh, the European uh, Union and the European Commission, because we know that, in fact, that in the European Union, we are quite ambitious in several matters, but also when it comes to energy. Um, the Energy Commission has a very ambitious policy in terms of energy. We have targets that are really difficult to be met, but only having difficult targets, we can achieve great results. And I believe this is the path we are uh, tracking these days. And in fact, we need to do this. Um, today, you know that uh, every day uh, energy prices are increasing. It's becoming very, very difficult. And this is not in, only in the past weeks. This is already for several continuous months because in fact, now we have competitive markets and we are in the energy transition, we are changing the way in which we produce and use energy. Uh, so we must put our cards on the table and to reflect and to do it in a much clever way. So I want just to um, show you that um, Currently, what we say in the European Union is that 
clean energy is needed for all Europeans. So it must be good for consumers, but also it must be good for the economy, for the growth, for the jobs, and also it must be good for the planet. And this is very, very important, not just because, of course, we have only this planet to live in, but also because we must be aware that when we use energy in one location, we don't harm the planet in that particular location. Uh, the problems of pollution, of uh, climate change, do not know about geographical or political barriers. So we, in fact, when we harm the location, we harm the whole planet. And this is very important. And this is also why we don't, uh, we won't achieve our targets if we work at the national level. Also, we cannot only work at the European level. We must work at the worldwide level. And of course, this is very, very difficult because uh, it's difficult that people agree on difficult targets and these are difficult targets indeed. And also it is difficult because countries are not all the same, of course. And for non-developing countries, for countries that are not so developed in economic and social terms, it's much more difficult. And that's why the countries that are in a different level, a higher level of development, should help the ones that are not to keep these targets so that together we can really meet these uh, targets. And I guess that you may have already heard about uh, some, um, sorry for that. That's the Zoom bar that is, uh, making it difficult. Uh, I believe that you may have heard already of some very important agreements at the worldwide level, namely in Paris 2015, known as COP15. Um, but these are rather modest. While they are rather modest, they are very, very important and we should go on like in the European Union, we are more advanced, I would say, with this directive that I am showing you here. This is a directive, so this is law, this is legislation, and it will be adopted by all um, European Union countries. Uh, this directive is uh, um, almost two years old, but in fact, it is very, very uh, innovative and it will mean a huge advancement when it comes to energy. As you can see here, it's a, a directive about the internal market for electricity. Um, and uh, when you look at it, maybe you say, oh, it, this is just market. But no, energy today is energy market. So this is about energy as a whole in the European Union. Okay, so let's try to go to the next slide. And I will show you uh, in a very simplified way our vision about energy. I must say that uh, this vision we have is not since today or yesterday. Uh, it's like this for several years, I would say for 15 or 20 years even. Uh, but we must look at energy as a whole. So we must look at renewables, of course. Renewables are very important uh, to uh, mitigate the impact, the impact that energy has in our planet because of climate change and the uh, negative impact that uh, traditional ways of producing energy have in the pollution, for instance. So we must look very attentively to renewables. We must look also to electric vehicles. And some years ago, they seemed quite difficult, but today they are a reality. And I must say that I believe that in the coming years, we will see much more, many and many electric vehicles in our homes. And also we must look at storage, because one problem of energy, namely when it comes to electrical energy, is storage. We have only a very, very small share of storage in the system. 
because of the different ways we have of storing energy which are compatible with the electrical system are very, very expensive. So we work with a very uh, low share of storage. It, it's not really comparable to any other uh, business in terms of storage. This, this makes it very difficult. But today we are also distributing this storage. We have storage at the lower levels of the system, smaller storage systems at the lower level of the system. We should look, of course, at the buildings because most of our time we live inside buildings. So buildings are very important, not only for our lives, but also for energy for energy consumption, of course, because we are in buildings, we have energy consumption in the buildings. But today we can also see buildings as a very important player in the energy system. We can produce energy in the buildings, we can store energy in the buildings, and we can make some exchange inside the buildings and from building to building. So this is important. What we can see here is also distributed generation because most of renewables are prone to be used in a distributed way. So we have not so much these large power plants, which sometimes are very useful, but also they are very difficult uh, to manage, namely in emergency situations. Uh, and the distributed generation is quite nice because we can have it close to people. Uh, but I must say that today we don't yet have the means to adequately manage this distributed generation. So we are still working on it. It is not enough to have a lot of renewables in the system. It's needed that we know how to manage this uh, energy that is produced by means of renewable energy sources. So distribution of generation, but also distribution of storage. And of course, electric vehicles are distributed by nature. They are not in one place, they are going around. Another important topic is about active consumers, because some years ago we thought that consumption was rigid. We could not change it. We would change production with the idea that we could not act on consumption. But today we know that it is not like that because of history, because of some energy crisis that we had around the world, namely in Brazil, for instance. And we realized that there is a flexibility in the consumer side. So we can have active consumers because they have flexibility, but also because they can produce energy at the local level, they can store energy at the local level, and they can participate in some uh, transactions. Aggregation is also very important. Why? Because we have distributed resources, because these are small resources, and only putting them together in a kind of aggregation or a community, we can manage them adequately because as a consumer, I'm not able to really manage my resources, but if I aggregate with others, I can do that management and I can address the difficult problems that require some kind of technical knowledge. So this is quite important. And finally, our system must be sustainable not just in energy terms, but also on environment terms and in economy terms. So this must be then um, as a whole, not just looking at energy, but looking at the uh, huge impacts of energy. So it is being a little difficult to go to the next one. Okay, now I got it. Here, yes. So our goals, the usual ones, we want to reduce costs, we want to increase profits, 
And of course, in the meantime, we want to ensure a good added value to this business. And also we must figure out how to distribute and share this value, because in fact, it's very important to ensure the added value. But if we cannot have a nice way of distributing and sharing this value, the value itself, it will not appear in all its potential. So this is very, very uh, important. For that, we have energy transactions, but also we have service provision because usually we think about energy that I need, but for having this energy available, we have a whole set of technical services that are required. So it's not all about energy by itself, it's about a whole set of services that um, make this service of selling and buying energy possible in technical terms. And of course, because of that, we need to look very carefully and in a very innovative way at business models, at the contracts and at the tariffs we are using. And we are always or almost always today using market-driven approaches. So we must keep this in our mind. And now talking about consumers and communities. Consumers are really important, of course, because consumers are people uh, and we must look at people. And this is very, very new in the energy area because in the energy area, it was not so common to look at people in this way. In fact, people were looked at consumers only. Utilities refer to uh, people as consumers. Retailers, the ones that sell us the energy, usually refer uh, to us as customers, of course. And uh, uh, for instance, in smart cities, we refer to people as citizens. And in fact, these are different aspects of people. And what we should look at is to figure out who these people are, who, what are the needs of these people, but also, are these people willing to contribute to a better system, to a better planet when they use energy, for instance? So the current studies on energy um, came to this point. And coming to this point, they are putting together a lot of different disciplines and areas and methods and tools. Because in fact, when it comes to energy, we, we cannot change a single aspect or two aspects. We must take care as an energy system is always a system, in, even if it is quite small. And we should treat it technically and scientifically with the best methods to keep it running all the time, because we need highly reliable systems in terms of energy, because don't forget, we must keep the lights on all the time. So we have a very good set of new opportunities that range from resource sharing to transactions with neighbors. These are local transactions depending on the consumers, for instance. Uh, also, we call them peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Uh, we must rely on transactive energy, mixing these transactions with the market and with the contracts. And also we have new organizations and markets. We have aggregators, which did not exist a few years ago. They still not exist in many countries, European countries. We have local markets not only what we are used to the wholesale market, but local market. And also we have energy communities, urban energy communities, more rural energy communities, but anyway, energy communities that can together to have a better use of their energy resources. So if I look at citizen energy communities, citizen energy communities is the term used in the directive. So it's a nice term because they look at us 
people as citizens. What I would say is uh, much better than looking at uh, the consumers, just consumers. They are based on the local generation, and this local generation is in a large extent based on renewable energy sources, which is very good. Also, we can have local storage, not a large share of storage, but local storage and electric mobility, of course. And with this, we can build a small energy system that is sustainable in energy and in technical terms. And of course, we can look at self-consumption because these people will consume energy, but also they will produce energy. We can look at demand flexibility and at demand response. So they, they can respond to third parties when there are needs for increasing or decreasing the consumption, peer-to-peer -peer transactions and local energy markets. So this is the directive I told you before. It is really important. And this is more technical, but just to tell you that uh, at all moments, we must keep the generation load balance. So we must keep attention. This is the key to the security of the system. If we are not able to keep this balance, the system will not run on, will not be able to keep our lights on. So this is very important, and that's why I'm telling you that Everything is nice. I can add more renewables and believe, oh, I have a lot of renewables in my system, so I'm sustainable. But this is not the case. We must deal with technical parts of the problem and we must put some additional flexibility on the side of consumption because when we move production towards renewables, we are losing flexibility on the generation side and losing flexibility on the generation side because the new ways of producing electricity are non-dispatchable. Why? Because I'm using the sun, I'm using the wind, maybe the waves in the sea, but I cannot say, please stop the wind or please blow up wind a little bit uh, stronger. So, it's important that we are aware that these are non-dispatchable technologies. I cannot store the sun directly or the wind or the wave uh, in the same way I do with, for instance, uh, the, uh, the waters in a river reservoir. So uh, I must have more flexibility on the consumer side and that's why consumers being able to produce energy and being able to change the energy, energy consumption pattern are becoming so important and in no way so powerful in this new phase. And electric vehicles, of course, we see that electric vehicles are a temptation today. Maybe we are still a little bit afraid because of batteries. Uh, maybe we should look one or two years uh, in the future to, uh, to have uh, more vehicles of uh, uh, this type than today, but it's sure that they will be the major part of transportation in the coming uh, future. So it's very important to look at them as a very important part of the system. Also, uh, they can uh, uh, interact with the other parts of the system because I can have what I call vehicle to everything because I can uh, connect the vehicle uh, to home, which I call V2H, but also vehicle to building, uh, vehicle to grid. Why? Because uh, there are batteries in the vehicle and of course these batteries have to be charged, so they need energy, electrical energy to be charged, but also they can discharge their energy in case of need. For instance, if I have a peak of consumption in a building, I can use a part of the energy in the electric cars that are in the building to 
uh, comply with the energy needs. Maybe because um, buying so much energy would be very expensive at that time. So I have a storage there and I can use it for a small time. This is quite interesting and flexible. And flexibility is indeed important for the system. Of course, we require some advancements. We must do an efficient management of the charging and discharging of the electric vehicles. And we also need new uh, demand response programs that are uh, adequate to these uh, uh, needs, because it is not the same for uh, the consumption in a building or for using a car. It's completely different, and we must uh, look at this problem as a different problem. Some figures for you to see that, in fact, uh, electric vehicles are being very important. Here we have the figures for 2019, and we have the uh, forecast for 2030 uh, in two different scenarios. In any scenario, in 2030, it is uh, sure that we will have a huge number of electric vehicles. So we should count on them uh, in terms of consumption, but also in terms of the role they may play in our system. And now I'm coming uh, home, I would say. I'm coming home because I'm showing you uh, the rooftop of our, of our living lab. Uh, this is uh, the building in, um, in which I usually work. Um, and this building, as you see, has uh, PV panels, photovoltaic panels in the rooftop. And also it has a lot of things inside which are quite interesting because we have been building up um, a series of experiences. We have been uh, buying uh, um, equipment from shelf that is equipment that is not sophisticated. That's the equipment that uh, you can use uh, at your business, in your homes every day. And with those uh, assets, we are building uh, a new form of producing and using energy because we are connecting that to our innovation, to our algorithms in terms of software, for instance. And of course, I would say that we work with a lot of students, we have a lot of scholarships. So if you want some time to visit us, and why not to apply for one of our scholarships and can uh, to work together with us at least for some time, I believe maybe it's a nice experience for you. As I told you, I am located in Porto, in Portugal, we are in the west part of Europe, so as far as possible um, from you, I guess, uh, if you can, if you want to stay in Europe, uh, we are close to the Atlantic Ocean, and um, the best advantage we have, I guess, that is our people, because we have uh, people who usually are very welcome. And, um, and uh, researchers that can, that can to stay with us really like not only our research center and uh, technical and scientific activities, but they enjoy a lot Porto. Porto and Portugal, that Porto in particular is a very unique city. I would say uh, the most important characteristic of Porto is friendly people and being very, very unique. Um, near the Douro, which is a very nice river. So this is an invitation if you have the opportunity. And this is in technical terms, some figures that show uh, equipment that uh, we use for our experiences. Um, you can recognize some of these assets. The, for instance, this green load is an industrial load that we use for uh, uh, emulating buildings because buildings use energy and this is an industrial load and we can use it to emulate the consumer's uh, behavior. Uh, but of course we have adapted it and now it is not controlled uh, by these uh, uh, devices but it is controlled by our algorithms, by our software. 
So we have a whole set of adaptive, adaptive equipment. For instance, here this is a battery uh, for a building. Here we are uh, putting together uh, hardware. These are uh, very small computers, I would say, microprocessors that are used for transactive energy, for transactions among the neighbors, for local energy transactions. So you can come and see it alive. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, a general picture of what we are doing. In fact, we uh, base most of our studies uh, on artificial intelligence because uh, we put together a set of researchers uh, that uh, in one way or another are using artificial intelligence. For instance, uh, my background in terms of uh, um, studies was energy and is energy, but when I went to do a PhD, I saw that artificial intelligence had a very nice set of methods to deal with energy problems. So I went to study artificial intelligence and since then, I've been using a lot of artificial intelligence-based methods to cope with difficult problems in the power and energy systems. So, in fact, this is what we do in that building that I've shown you. And we address difficult problems, usually real-time problems in power and energy with artificial intelligence methods. Of course, also with other methods, but usually with one or another artificial intelligence method. And our particular characteristic is that we use much more than machine learning because there are a lot of people in power and energy using machine learning, knowledge discovery, optimization and computational intelligence. But apart from that, we also use this method that I put almost outside the circle uh, that most people in energy are not using. And in fact, they can be very, very important to address in a nice way these problems that we have in the energy area this time. For instance, we use uh, uh, context awareness, we use ontology, semantic agents and multi-agent system, user models, expert systems, and so on. And of course, for that, we have been participating in quite a good number of projects. I would say more than 60 projects in the past five years with funding because we need, of course, funds to, to have people working and to have this equipment and this infrastructure. And we have both international, mostly European and national projects. And also we need partners because we are an academic uh, institution. We have a research center with people with different backgrounds, but we need that um, input from industry. So we have a lot of uh, academic partners, but also a lot of uh, industrial partners, more than 100 companies in more than 12 countries that help us and of course we help them uh, but uh, what we gain with that is that we know what the reality is what the real problems are and we are working not just in terms of uh, um, fundamental science but mostly in applied science you can have a look at uh, some our steps Namely, we have working for a long time in data. Data is a problem because there are different problems in all areas, but also in energy that depend on the availability and use of data. But when people want to work there sometimes, or most of the time, they have the problem that they do not have the data to go on because there is data privacy, data security issues. And this is a real problem because people cannot advance in science, cannot advance in engineering because they don't have the available data. 
So we have been working for many years uh, towards having the, uh, good data for uh, working in, this, in these areas. And of course, you may contribute yourself if you have possibility for this publicly data set. Also, each year we organize uh, several competitions. Usually they are supported by large conferences, namely IEEE conferences. And you can look at this site where we describe some past competitions. Here I show you the conceptual approach of, um, of our work. Most of our work is based on agents and multi-agent systems because they represent very nicely this distributed nature of power and energy area that I referred before because everything is distributed because one consumer is not exactly like the other, because one production plant is not exactly like the other, but also because we have a lot of interactions that involve people. There is a social aspect there, not just a technological one. Um, we should uh, look at methods that can model this kind of behavior. And agents are very good for that. That's why we are using agents and multi-agent systems a lot. Uh, most of people use one multi-agent system. We use a set of multi-agent systems. And that's why we came to the point of using a society of multi-agent systems. Uh, and this is a good upgrade in our work. We are using these systems not only for modeling, but for real-time management of the energy resources. And that's why that building is a living lab because we have that running continuously in our uh, This uh, is maybe a good, uh, a good diagram to show you that retailers and aggregators are very important here because in this kind of energy communities, we can have one multi-agent system representing each community and we can individually look at the members of those communities. So we have agents to do that. For instance, we have smart buildings, but then we have suppliers of the services and we can, with these agents, have decision support for people but not only decision support, we can have automated action. And of course, when I have automated action, it's good that it is done in an intelligent way and that as a consumer, for instance, I understand that this is good for me, that the automated actions that are being taken are good for me and are not harming my interests. And also we are using a lot of semantics and ontologies because it's very difficult when you are looking at this distributed and low level of system, having lots of different equipment. Um, and they must come together and understand each other. And because they are very different from different manufacturers, from different owners, it's very difficult to ensure that. So we are using semantic and knowledge-based approaches to be able to put their semantic on each concept that every device, every system can uh, understand and with that they can um, be uh, talking with each other. So we have real-time monitoring, for instance, this is one part of that building I have shown you before. We have this uh, controller board for the building. The building is uh, being monitored all the time. Uh, this is the west block and we have different things in the other side of the building. Uh, this is a nice system that we call C2C. Uh, click to control and that we use daily in system. It's all developed by us. What we can do with this, uh, a lot of different things, but for instance, I can use the system uh, to control the intensity of the lights in my room 
uh, and my room will be different from the other room, but at the same time, the system is in the back uh, managing the old consumption according to the local uh, production, according to the real time prices, and so on. So there is an interaction with people, people really interact with the system, but also the system is doing the best possible management of the energy that is being produced and used. Um, this is a system that can be used in the desktop, but also in your smartphone, on your tablet, and so on. Uh, just some pictures, because we have a lot of software, AI-based software mostly, but also some works that go through the hardware, because we need these devices to be interacting with our software. We have uh, Internet of Things approach. We have developed a new generation of a smart plug that we have, we have connected, for instance, to a fridge that we have in the research center. This is another view for the click and control system. In fact, this is a wall panel, so a panel, um, a display, if you want, which is installed in a wall in our corridor. And in this wall, you can uh, look at the system, see different aspects, different uh, um, equipments, which uh, you can also change, not only when it comes to energy, but also you can control here the doors, automatically open and close doors, and so on. And finally, uh, I will tell you that these communities can organize themselves because the normal, traditional way of doing it is just uh, having uh, one consumer that buys energy. And recently, we have maybe a little advance because we have a consumer that also produces energy, and we call that a prosumer. And this prosumer will buy energy from a retailer. That's normal today. But also, we can put different things in our system. We can, for instance, have these. Uh, prosumers interacting among them with those local transactions and transactive energy, we can put aggregators there to better manage the energy resources, and we can mix all together and go to the electricity market trying to have the best possible solution for this community. And this, very, this is very important because you know that prices and costs are very important. Energy prices have been increasing lately, which is normal. It's not to blame renewables. Um, but you see in the top uh, tariffs, which are traditional, which are maybe flat tariffs, they do not change, or tariffs that TOE, that's tariff that depends on the time, time of use, as in the headline, and in the button of this slide, you can see a different approach to prices, which is a dynamic price, price based on the market. So if you look and compare the two of them, of course, it's very different. So we are really addressing a different problem today. OK, and now very briefly, because I want to let you sometimes to ask for questions. I'm considering one community inside a building. The idea is that you have an office building, and this office building will rent offices. So, so I have the office building owner, and I have some people, some businesses that rent the office in this building. And you have the building total generation with photovoltaic panels. In this case, this is our building. You saw the TV panels in the roof. Uh, and also, you have these five uh, agents, uh, with the Z0 being the owner of the building, so he owns the most part of the generation. But also, the other agents, when they rent the, the office, they also can rent a part of this generation. In this case, 10% each. So 
I can put up the, the, the local community and this local community can interact. So don't forget that each player will have its own interests. They are not, let us say, friends working together. They are just cooperating, okay? But they still have their own interests, individual interests. For instance, here I'm running a local uh, market. Uh, what you see in different colors, I cannot control, maybe like this, um, the cursor. You can see a different uh, color and different uh, shapes. These are different kinds of auctions that can be uh, used in this local market. But what is important is that I have here uh, the energy to be bought because the community itself is not uh, totally sufficient in energy terms. I have in yellow and also it can be here uh, behind the, the gray area, the energy to be sold because I have some energy that I can sell. And uh, in gray, I have the energy that the community has been able to trade inside itself. So what's important to see here is that uh, in different uh, scenarios, namely, for instance, uh, high demand and low supply, low generation, or a low demand and high supply scenario, I can have this local trade, and this local trade will lower my prices. This is the idea to retain. And in fact, if we see the prices according to the difference between the demand, which is the energy we need for community, and the supply, which is in this case the generation inside the community, I see this increase. Because if I can have a larger margin for uh, the generated energy in what uh, um, referring to the needs, uh, I can have, in fact, lower prices for my energy. So the way in which the community behaves can determine the prices. We can have that power as consumers if we are able to organize ourselves and to take advantage of our community. And that's all for today. This was uh, my content and my message. I hope I could pass it to you and that you can find it useful today and in future to come. Thank you a lot. Oh, thank you, Professor Zita. That was really interesting. And I'm sure students will, our audience will have quite a lot of questions. Anyone? Uh, hello, I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, I'm interested in um, renewable and uh, comparison between mm -hmm. renewable and non-renewable uh, energy sources. Uh, so uh, first, uh, could we predict in um, which period of time uh, we will run out of uh, fossil fuels if we continue to use them uh, this much as now, if we don't, do not reduce uh, consumption? That's a nice question. And that's a very important aspect for the energy area uh, and for the future, today and future. Because, in fact, we are talking every day about renewables and coming close to 100% of renewables. Uh, but we are not there, of course. We have news uh, in some days, uh, for instance, in Portugal, Sometimes we have in the news, we are running for the past five days on renewables. <laughs> and it's important that renewables include, of course, hydro energy, which is quite traditional, it's not new at all, uh, in terms of electrical energy. So we are still needing a lot of fossil um, energy sources. We cannot let them go for the moment uh, for two reasons. One reason is that uh, we do not have yet installed enough renewable-based plants. As you, as you see today, uh, they can be very small. 
it can be my home if I put these PV panels in the top, in the rooftop. Um, we don't have quite enough of those installed, but there are other problems because it is not enough to have the right amount of renewable based assets for producing electrical energy. And here I'm talking about electrical energy. Um, it's necessary that we address some technical problems. For instance, we have an European project addressing the problem of running the electricity market with almost 100% of renewables. And this is not yet possible today because electricity markets need quite a long period for you to bid, that is to offer your energy. And then it will come to the physical um, delivery, but not at the same point. It means that they are not real-time markets. Mostly they are based on one hour auctions uh, or 15 minutes auctions. And we would need, but not for uh, all the energy, only for a part of that energy. And we would need to have this 15 or five minutes period for the large amount of energy coming from renewables. And this is really difficult right now, because I told you, we must ensure the balance between production and consumption. If I produce more, I must consume more. If I produce less, I must consume less. But this should be done in real time. And renewables are not dispatchable. I cannot tell, oh, please, sun, be brighter now because I have here a lot of consumption to be supplied, right? So because I do not have that ability, I need fossil, right now. But we are running in the right way. We are advancing. And today, we have a lot more possibilities and we are being able to come closer to higher shares of renewable, but not yet close to 100%, not yet, okay? And for that, demand flexibility is very important because I can say, I have this demand, so I have to produce more. Or I can say, I have this demand and this production, so I should consume less, right? So that's why demand flexibility is very important and consumers and these smart energy communities can represent a very important contribution to this energy transition, transition towards 1% renewable. I cannot tell you it's uh, in 10 years or in 20 years. I guess we are still needing some fossil for, um, for security, of course. Um, but also when it comes to distributed energy, they ensure some kind of security. Because if you have a large plant, which is uh, uh, with a failure, okay, it cannot work. It's a huge power plant uh, and it will harm a lot of people which will not be supplied in an energy terms. Um, but if you have a lot of distributed power plants, we can rely on them at least for a good part of your, of your consumption. Even if not for the old consumption, for a good part of your consumption. So I believe we are really in that way. Okay, thank you a lot for answer. I have one more question. Um, so I'm, I'm a student uh, of energy engineering, so I'm very concerned uh, about this um, Topics um, here uh, in Slovenia, there is uh, one uh, thermal power plant, uh, coal uh, thermal power plant, and uh, they are predicting that in 10 years, um, this place will run out of coal. Uh, so I'm afraid that uh, this is um, going to happen uh, a lot in the future gener generations um all over the world so um uh i will uh is it possible um 
that uh, to completely replace uh, fossil fuels with renewable energy sources in the future uh, before we uh, run out of uh, fossil fuels. I mean, um, will we uh, succeed to uh, completely um, get onto renewable energy sources before uh, we actually don't have any other option? Uh, to begin with, I'm not convinced that we will run out of fossils uh, because, you know, uh, fossils, if I look at the history, fossils that uh, we have run out of fossils many, many years ago, because this is a kind of forecast. And uh, let us say 40 or 50 years ago, the forecast was that today we have no fossils, almost no fossils at all. And in fact, we have and we have a lot. Still. So I'm not so convinced that they will run, we will run out of uh, fossils. I believe that we will be discovering more and more resources. And of course, we use them less than today. So also they will last longer than forecasted some years ago. But I believe that in fact, in some years, we can um, let uh, several types of fossils, uh, at least for producing electrical energy. Um, it's the same in Portugal. In Portugal, we have been closing some thermal, very important and very large thermal power plants. We don't have nuclear in Portugal, but we have large thermal, traditional, conventional power plants, and we have closed some recently. Um, so it's possible. We have to look at those services. I told you before, it's not just important to have energy to buy and to sell. It's important to ensure technical services. And a good part of technical services is about research. Um, I have the need to run the system in a secure way. And for that, I need a, a whole range of different reserves. It's not one kind of reserve. It's very different kinds of reserves that I have to ensure. And some of these reserves are very nicely insured by conventional term, thermal power plants. And they are not very nicely insured today uh, by the other means, by renewables. They cannot be in full insured by renew renewables, but they can be in the future insured by demand flexibility and by storage. So we are still working on it. It's not possible today, but I'm firmly consumer, uh, con uh, convinced one that we will not run out of fossils. Uh, I will say for many generations. And second, that we will not need many fossil resources to run electrical energy businesses. And we must figure out that we are uh, making everything electric, right? Because now cars are becoming electric, so we need electric energy for cars. And also heating and cooling is becoming more and more electric because before it was mostly non-electric for the buildings, for instance, but also for water. Water heating uh, is now much more dependent on electrical energy. So we are electrifying almost everything in terms of energy, which is also important. And this is why electrical energy is becoming so much important that before, than before, because we are electrifying almost every use of energy. And that's why also why it's very important to intelligently manage the electrical energy production and use, because now we are doing it at a much larger extent than it was done, I would say, 10 or 20 years ago. But we are in that way. We are, we are not solving all the problems, but we are surely solving a lot of problems. Uh, I would say that in Europe we are ambitious, not only because we, are, we love our planet, not just because we love that people are well in this planet, but also because in economic terms, fossils have a problem in Europe. We are very, very dependent from others, right? And this is why 
it's important to use the resources we have, namely wind and sun, uh, Europe has wind and sun, not so much fossil. Um, so it's very important that we go on that way, not just because of the planet, but also because of our economy and even our security of supply. We must be sure that we are able to supply the energy that is needed for people, for business, for industry and so on. Okay, thank you, Professor Zita. Uh, we have still Dasha, very quick question because we are running out of the time. Dasha? Okay, uh, actually, <clears throat> I'm very interested in this institute because I'm a mechanical engineer and I had many courses actually before in uh, air conditioning and also management. And I'm doing now my master at Zigan University in mechatronics. And next, and actually, I did my center work in artificial intelligence and deep learning. That's why I was interested in this one. And also, I have courses in uh, Internet of Things. So I want to just to ask you: Is it possible that I can do internship or something like this in your institute? Yes, sure. We are very much interested in people like you. Um, we are very op open when it comes to, um, to receiving people from abroad and we have uh, people coming from different countries, uh, either for projects, I mean for uh, being hired for, uh, from us, or uh, people that are coming because they are uh, working with partners uh, in projects. Um, you can look at uh, our web page. Uh, let me see if I can change this. And this as well, Professor's email, so you can contact yes, her. Yes, you the... can contact me by email, but also you have here, uh, you see this, um, this uh, web it's link. Like go mm. directly to our website, our research center is called Checkout, and we always have there the opportunities for scholarships. What you must have in mind is that in legal terms, we must, um, we must ensure that your, uh, your uh, degree is valid in, uh, in Portugal. And uh, if your degree is from a European country, this recognition is very easy to do. Of course, if you come with a degree from outside Europe, from Brazil, from America, from uh, Asia, it's a little more difficult. Of course, it will be done, but it takes a little more time. So when you apply for one of those scholarships, it's good that you take that in mind that you need this process but uh, I understand that your degree is from Europe and in that case it's rather quick and easy so no problem at all and we love to have this kind of people uh, who are really interested in these problems because motivation is our full full right for this kind of research okay so I can apply for this link for internship or something like this right sure sure Okay, great then, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> Professor Zita, thank you very much for being the part of our Smart Community Workshop. And we're looking forward to see you soon, all of us, <laughs> who will be participating in on-site uh, part as well. And yes, uh, at the moment, we will have a break of 10 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. So we will come uh, 35 past um, 12, and then we will take the floor to um, Associate Professor from South Korea, Rafael, who's already present here and was listening to questions, questions and answers and as well half of the presentation. So let's get back in 10 minutes. Okay. So um, again, thank you for, for inviting me into this workshop, which um, I was put into this section under smart community architecture and cities. So I wanted to discuss uh, research that I've been doing for the past years in relationship to urbanism and architecture and the way that perhaps we should be looking at um, the way that cities are growing in order to do it in a more smart way. So I've titled this lecture, Smart Islands. 
Uh, and in order to start, I wanted to make a reference to this um, article that comes from 2020. And as you know, we had this World Urban Forum that um, you know thousands of, of attendees and world leaders got together and discussed what is the future of our cities. And as you can see from the title, World Urban Forum ends with a call for united action to ensure sustainable future for cities and towns. From this, there was a whole global discussion about these 17 goals that we should all have in order to achieve uh, a sustainable future. And in my case, because I'm in architecture and urbanism, uh, I mean, they all affect, but number 11 is specific to sustainable cities and communities. And we started thinking about, you know, well, what does that mean to have sustainable cities and communities? Um, some of the trends of the 21st century have been to focus into smart technologies to build smart cities. But from my perspective, one of the biggest uh, problems that we have is how do we define the area of intervention to achieve these goals? First of all, we keep on talking about sustainable cities, smart cities, the word city. But in fact, we are in a constant state of urbanization, which is very different than saying city. City is a self-contained, um, a very formal aspect of a human settlement, while urbanization comes from a different project completely. It's an infrastructural driven project that has to do with expansion of settlement. Urbanization actually comes from uh, Ildefon Cerda in the 1860s when he proposed uh, ex the, the expansion of Barcelona. So it's actually a fairly new term and it has to do with that. And actually his project had to do with getting people out of city centers and expanding onto the landscape, onto what we now know suburbia in order to provide a better, um, better settlement conditions, basically get out of the, the polluted condensed city centers and, and give more space to people. That was the initial proposal. And we have never really left that proposal. The world is in continuous urbanization. Um, I'm, I'm sure everybody has seen also UN reports and uh, European Union uh, Urban Commission reports of, you know, that the world is more than 50% urbanized and that they expect it to be 75% urbanized by, you know, whatever year. So we're in a constant state of urbanization and the term city is, somewhat kind of, I would say ambiguous, even though we keep on using it. This is the current state that we are looking at. Uh, I'm just gonna show you some slides um, to kind of talk about this argument between city and urbanization. You know, how do we define what we're gonna be working with? For example, this is Miami, right? This is the Florida panhandle, but we can really say this is Miami. Like if you look at the, at the globe at night, we see this endless expansion of infrastructural connections, right? This is Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all the way up to um, Jacksonville, I think it's up in the north. Uh, on, the, on the west, it's Tampa and Orlando. Basically, it's just one continuous mass, right? When you see the light, this is New Delhi. Right, but um, you can see the expansion of the the brightest light, but where does it end? It actually covers all of uh, Northern India. We, we can't really say that New Delhi is one point. Um, Europe, right? Uh, and I, I picked Milan, but it could have been anywhere else. Um, and the same condition, right? You see from Torino, Milano, all the way to Vincenza, uh, Venice, all as one continuous urbanity and also expanding south. And again, if you look at the European continent, you'll see the same effect. Um, New York, New York City, right? It's the whole East Coast. It actually goes from Boston all the way down to Washington, DC. You see the Chicago area, Atlanta area, uh, Sao Paulo in South America, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And the context that I've been working in is mainly 
East Asia and specifically Seoul. Uh, this is Tokyo and Seoul, but I don't even know if we talk about Tokyo or Seoul. Instead, we should be talking about Japan and, Korea, and South Korea. It's almost the whole thing, right? So talking about sustainable cities, it's, it's, it's kind of a difficult scenario when this is the reality that we're dealing with, right? So that brings a point, like, what are we talking about? Is there an administrative boundary that we should be focusing on versus urban sprawl? Like, how do we control urban sprawl or how do we, how do we deal with these conditions in order to really start forming smart communities and smart cities, right? So again, going back to the context where I work in, uh, the city of Seoul, if you can see the white boundary line, that is actually the administrative boundary that is known as the city of Seoul. And it's just a political boundary. It's a, you know, it's a GIS boundary, it's a virtual boundary. That's not really how the city works. It's not like you get to the boundary and the city stops, right? If you see the urban sprawl, you have people coming from Incheon, Asan, Ansan, uh, Suwon in the south, the whole Gyeonggi, Gyeonggi-do province area surrounding Seoul. Um, people commute hours to come to work into Seoul, right? So it's this whole conglomeration of uh, the conurbation that works economically as one zone. It's not that administrative boundary that suddenly stops the condition of city, right? So we have these administrative boundaries that we formulate in order to start treating cities in a way that we can manage them because the reality is that they're ever expanding their huge conurbation so we have these virtual boundaries and then we can come up with uh, quantitative data that we can measure and compare to other cities you know typical ones of areas and we can measure geographies water greens we can measure uh, densities, and this is actually sub-political boundaries. This is um, KU, which is districts within Seoul, which again, it's another virtual made up political boundary, uh, just so that we can um, have a proper administration of the different districts, right? But um, again, it's not like you leave Gangnam Gu and go to uh, Sondong Gu and it's over, right? It's a, the city is continuous, roads are continuous, infrastructure is continuous, the city doesn't work as administrative boundaries. There's a difference between the reality and the virtual um, boundaries that I think we need to address. And these are the type of um, data that we come up with when we look at administrative boundaries, right? So then we can compare London, New York, Berlin, but what does this really mean? I mean, it does give us a sense. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know how accurate it is, but it does give us a, it gives us a sense when we compare London to New York, Berlin, Istanbul, whatever, with this uh, quantitative data that comes from the administrative boundary. Um, but the point that I'm gonna try to make is that we should perhaps get rid of the idea of the city unit, uh, stop thinking about smart city, and instead let's start thinking of uh, smart islands which are subunits of urbanity, subunits of city that come from the built form. Like we should try to understand the built form before we can even address the virtual boundaries. From the built form, we can actually get quantitative data, which is perhaps more important, well, not perhaps more important, but it is um, supportive data to the qualitative data. So from the qualitative data, we can get you know, FAR, BCR, um, yeah, like density measures, uh, GDP, economical measures, uh, all of those things. But we don't really understand how the city works. Where do people live? When you look at images like, for example, these, you don't know if are people living in high rises and slums. Is this all slums, right? So we have no idea. We can still measure the 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 quantitative data, but we don't know the quality of urbanization that is happening here. So when I think of the physical, the subunit, the smart islands, um, 
there are some incentives happening already around the world that have already started. So for example, Paris is looking at its condition of, of urbanization and thinking of these subunits through the 15 minute city. And this was a proposal made by the, the mayor of uh, Paris, right? So the whole idea is that your unit, your neighborhood unit should be within 15 minutes from where you live. From, from where you live, you should have access to uh, job, entertainment, um, grocery services, amenities, right? And then that becomes your neighborhood unit, which again, it's, it's for me in this case, it's just an idea because it doesn't really bind what your neighborhood unit is. And the density of Paris is, is so high that the, then does that mean that the neighborhood next, I mean, the, the person living a block away from you also needs that 15 minute radius and the, per, the block next block also needs that 15 minute radius, which just becomes the whole, you know, the whole urbanity needs 15 minute radius. Uh, then the radius is kind of lost, right? Um, Barcelona is tackling it more from the built form, which is what I'm more interested in. So they're looking at the super manzanas, which combines uh, three by three of the Cerda grid, the one that we originally talked about how they describe urbanization or how Cerda describe urbanization. So they are combining this three by three grid into a mega grid, which can become pedestrian friendly within that boundary. And then that becomes a neighborhood unit. So at least this has a spatial sense, right? We can actually uh, measure the area, measure the neighborhood unit. It's again, it's three by three grid of the Barcelona block, which is 110 by 110, uh, I think meters. So it's measurable in terms of uh, space. We can analyze the qualitative conditions, right? We can see, you know, are these mid rise, high rise, low rise, are these slums? We know the, the quality of buildings. We know how people live. So we can get the qualitative data as well as the quantitative data. So I think this is a smarter way of trying to tackle this condition, right? Um, for Seoul, I've been looking or trying to study what are the typological islands that occur in Seoul, which actually happen to grow organically. I'm not gonna give the whole history of, of how they grew, but basically, there's been different transitions in the political governance and economical policies of uh, Seoul that have led to the city develop specific typological islands. And so far I've identified nine of them that are architectural typological islands. Um, these are enclaves where a single typology is grouped together. So you have a single typology, let's say low rise, and then it's grouped into one boundary, just similarly as we just talked about the Barcelona Super Manzana or one high rise apartment block and that's grouped into one unit, right? So I'm gonna quickly uh, discuss them, but as I mentioned, these come from specific governance periods. So there's the Choson dynasty uh, from 1394 all the way to uh, 1897, which mainly only had two typologies, um, the political form block and iconic form block. I'll, I'll discuss them uh, soon. Then the Dehan Empire, which was short-lived 1397 to uh, 1910. Then there was the Japanese colonial period from 1910 to 1945. Uh, there was an industrial period uh, of rapid growth from 1963 to 1979. Um, then there was uh, a period where they wanted to be a global city, which comes after 1979, so 1980, all the way to um, 2002. And then Current, the current state of the 21st century is that it wants to be a cultural city, looking at the cultural industries and then that develop um, other typologies. And that's from 2002, I would say, all the way to the present. Each of the typologies that have been identified in each of these periods actually produces a different grid in the city. So there's specific typologies and each specific typology produces a specific grid. Um, 
some of the, I'll just show you through aerials and uh, some, basically the nine typologies that I've identified, the political form blog basically forms its own compound and it's a gated, you can think of it as a gated community that forms its own, own urbanity inside of itself. Um, in during the Chosun dynasty, those were basically the, the royal grounds like palaces that they would have a wall, a fortress wall, and then they would build its own city inside of that fortress wall. And the city itself would have its own fortress wall. So it was like a fortress wall inside of a fortress wall. Uh, the contemporary condition, it's uh, university campuses work this way. They actually gate the entire campus and you have only specific gates where you can enter. Um, and then they formed its own urbanity inside of itself. So you would have uh, dormitories and campus buildings and administrative buildings and all these other things, um, even like retail shops and restaurants. All of this happens inside of university campuses. Uh, we've actually analyzed all the 39 campuses that are inside of the city of Seoul, and, and they're all very similar, despite them all being different universities, but they follow the same typology. And as you can see from the aerial, they cover a huge amount of ground uh, in order for them to be almost their own city. And interestingly enough, they kind of follow like an American suburban uh, campus condition, even though they're inside of a highly dense city. So that's how you can start seeing these uh, distinctions of how it's working as its own entity. It's autonomous from the rest of the city. Uh, then you have iconic form blocks, which are mainly made of landmark buildings. Um, a lot of the government buildings work this way. They take a huge amount of land, they form a block, and it becomes, you know, public parks. But it's mainly to show the power of the of the government. So you have like the National Assembly uh, block. Um, there's the Olympic block, for example. These are the apartment blocks, uh, which mainly happened starting in 1962 and they've dominated the landscape in terms of housing. And the way that they work is through a land readjustment um, act. They take a lot of parcels and they build them as one single parcel, which a single developer or a single construction company can just come in and build 2000 households at once. So you end up getting these um, brands of apartments that constitute about 2,000 units at one. So for example, this is Akuyon um, apartment complex, but you can see behind there's another one. And to the left, here's another one. And you can tell they're different just because of the color change, uh, which is just the branding, right? So, but if you can see in the far uh, top, there's more apartments over here. Uh, on, the, on the right as well. So, I mean, the whole landscape works this way in terms of the housing. The majority of housing is this way. And each of these works as its own uh, compound, right? So the entire parcel, it's one apartment complex and the whole apartment complex, again, it's almost like it's its its, its own urban island. Uh, then when you have megaform blocks, which also started in the 1960s and um, it started not as a competition to the apartment block, but basically these were government driven projects and they couldn't take over more private land. So they started building over land that the government owned, which was mainly roads. So they started forming these huge buildings, taking over infrastructure, basically like uh, this is Eugene Sangha, which originally was used for a uh, uh, a military purpose was they would have the, the the tanks in the basement and they could easily be deployed into the city uh, and it also forms like a fortress almost and and uh, on the top is just an arcade of retail and housing so you start mixing these huge infrastructural projects with retail and housing um, the most famous one is Seun Sangha which actually spans over five city blocks and it's the same condition. It, it's um, infrastructure in the bottom, you have roads and then pedestrian decks on the top and then housing and retail. So these are huge mega forms, which also try to fill in the 2000 household number. So you have the apartment blocks, which are 2000 households, these mega forms, which are also trying to reach that number. Then you have super blocks, which, um, also, I find funny that like in the European context, let's say Barcelona is trying to do the super manzana. 
this is already already a 800 by 800 meter block uh which started as a way for Seoul to rapidly urbanize so they just made the 800 by 800 meter block and then they left it up to the individual private developer to do its own grid inside of the 800 by 800 meter block and the city has a specific FAR and zoning for the edge of the block so I don't know if you can tell that much but the edge of the block has high rises it has higher density and all the main commercial buildings are on the edge so it almost fo- forms like a it's almost like a fortress wall and then you go inside of that boundary and it's low rise high density so it almost feels like a medieval village right uh only that it's like a commercial medieval village for some reason it's it's these high rise commercial boundaries and then you go in and it's like uh yeah 12 the maximum street with inside of the block is like 12 meters but you have like six meter three meter roads uh so yeah it feels very weird that you're like in these 60 meter boulevards at the edge which are very um i don't know if you've seen like blade runners they're very futuristic like you, you see these gigantic boulevards with gigantic uh commercial buildings and then you go inside and it's like a quaint medieval uh you know meandering streets and little shops and cafes and boutiques and all these things um but again it's a self-contained unit and inside of the block you have schools you have uh, shops restaurants amenities services all of these things then you have tower blocks, which is almost like the mega form, which was horizontal, but now you have it vertical. Um, especially in Asia, there's the competition of the super tall towers, right? Uh, so Lotte Tower is one of those. It's actually the fifth tallest in the world. It's 122 stories. Um, and yeah, it houses basically everything. The, it was built by KPF and the KPF uh, president actually calls it as a vertical city and that that was the intent. And they see it that the vertical city unit is the next unit of urbanity that we should be thinking of cities in this way as a vertical units of urbanity. Um, I'm, I'm just showing the extreme, which is that super tall tower, but basically there's many of these high rises, not 122 stories, but like 60 story high rises that work as vertical cities they house um basically retail offices uh entertainment uh hotels which could count as accommodations as some type of living condition uh especially when there's a lot of influx of um migratory population or migrating population so the tower itself also becomes a unit of urbanity its own its own island then you have these deep blocks, which are a single building that takes over the entire block. Uh, this is Lotte World. And yeah, it's, I mean, one easy way to understand them is the super malls of Asia. Uh, but again, you can find everything in here. And some of these actually do have apartments so that you could actually live in here, right? So they have everything that you can think of from entertainment, to housing, uh commerce basically everything inside of one shell right the the shell itself actually it's i would i would say it's not significant in terms of architecture because what you're experiencing inside is completely different than what you see outside and again there's many of these uh deep block conditions in seoul where the single shell takes over an entire block and an entire block here um it's about 300 meters by 300 meters or uh, for example coex it's 600 meters by 300 meters that's one single deep block right if you think about 600 meters by 300 meters uh put it in the european context again if we put it in the barcelona context that's about uh seven barcelona blocks right so you can imagine how many people can fit inside of one of these shells or the type of activities can happen in these shells um during the cultural period, which I, I mentioned, it's 2000 and from the turn of the century, 2002 to the present, there's this there's been this policy of trying to make Seoul a, a cultural capital. So they've been um, 
there was actually a policy in 2008 to form cultural enclaves in the city. This is Sore Village, which is known as the French Village. And you can kind of see the, the collection of these um, low-rise villas that form the neighborhood. And then they're bounded also by geography. But just like this one, there's also the International Village, UN Village, um, ones that you can think of as like Chinatown or to Little Tokyo, things like that. Um, there's Hanok Village, which is the traditional Korean Chosun Dynasty typology. Um, the, the little remaining ones that are left, they got in, put into an enclave. If you've seen any K-drama, that's where they film it, for example, because it's uh, a historical setting. But they happen as little enclaves in the middle of the city. So you have these very modern buildings, and then all of a sudden you have these uh, Chosun Dynasty Hanoks. And it's, yeah, very different to be in the Hanok village than to be in just regular modern um, grid, for example, right? So, so you have these uh, almost as a, what Michel Foucault would call as heterotopias, uh, almost escapisms inside of the city of Seoul. Again, little islands that happen inside of Seoul. Then you have uh, the podium block, which this addressed a lot of the issues that the apartment block. So for example, here on the left, you see an apartment block happening and the apartment block is very monocultural. It's only apartment buildings, nothing else happens in there. So they lack a lot of amenities and services. Um, and they started in the 1960s. So you can imagine that it was mainly due to uh, produce quantity rather than quality of urban space. Um, in the 2000s, this was addressed with this typology. How do you have amenities, services, but still have the apartment blocks that you can build density? Then you put one on top of the other, basically. So they build podiums that take over entire blocks. Again, these are huge podiums, uh, not as big as the deep block, I would say, but they could be. And then on top of that podium, they just infill with apartment blocks. So it's taking this and then putting it on top of a deep block almost. Um, right, so each of these islands, which I, again, I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to calculate, I'm still doing the calculation, but they take uh, the majority of the urban fabric in Seoul is composed by these typological islands that are repeated throughout the city. And not just within the boundary, they get repeated as, they, as the urbanization expands. So they become units of urbanization. And each of them has its own quantitative uh, data, but also its uh, qualitative conditions, right? So we can measure the type of spaces that they create and how you live inside of each of these blocks. So for example, just to give you the street views, like political form block looks like this, and you enter the gate, and then you're in Yonsei University, for example. Uh, iconic form block, it's just a landmark building, doesn't have much around it. Uh, the apartment blocks, you see them as these compounds, which you wouldn't go there unless you live there, even though they're open, they're not really gated communities. They're just, it's just one block and it just has apartments. And, um, but just the blocks in Seoul are so huge. Again, remember that there's 800 by 800 meter, 300 by 300 meter, that you're not gonna walk from, here to the other one just because like you go here for a purpose you go here because you live here um so also the size make them work as as urban islands because there's no real pedestrian connection let's say in that say in that sense this is one of the mega form blocks uh so you can see the um uh, this is 400 meters long by an average 11 meters wide so if you think of 11 meters wide by 400 meters long um, it, yeah, it's, it's, they're like ridiculous typologies. It's like giant walls in the middle of the city, but you have people living here and then it's uh, markets and shops and everything. The tower block there, again, there's not much street life around a super tall tower. It all happens inside. Um, 
more of these deep blocks. Uh, this is what you see. You just see a giant shell, right? Take over the entire block. These are the cultural blocks. So for example, this is the Bukchon uh, Hanok village. And you can see in the back, the modern city, but inside of the block is just Hanoks, right? Uh, so again, each of these has a specific quality of space. This is a podium block. You can even see the trees on top of the podium. They're trying to build the, the same uh, conditions of the apartment blocks, but on top of another deep block, on top of another building. And this one at street level has a lot of uh, retail. And then on the podium level, it's it's the park for the towers in the towers in the green, right? Trying to build. Okay, so how can we use these islands? If we understand that these are subunits of urbanity and they are repeated throughout the city, uh, that gives us a lot of information on how to treat this as uh, you know, using new smart technologies and, and whatever we want to implement for smart infrastructures, we can get, um, uh, first, we can get a new mapping of the city. We can get an understanding of how the city is grouped into these islands. Uh, this is an aerial view looking from Nansam Tower uh, that you would see, for example, cultural, cultural blocks, apartment blocks, iconic blocks. You can start grouping the city based on its typological blocks and actually start forming quick mappings of how the city is composed by these typologies. These are four, um, let's say urban cores of the city, four of the main areas of the city, the central business district, Yoido and Yongdompo, uh, Jamshil and Kangnam. Uh, if you look at it from the typological condition, you no longer see this map of the figure ground that it just looks like, uh, if you remember at the beginning when you just see this, the globe at night that you just see endless, yellow or whatever that is. And, and you don't know if people are living in slums or in high rises, is it nice, is it not nice? Or you know, what are the urban conditions? This, this gives you that qualitative reading. We can still have that sense of how the city is expanding, but now we can get a sense of how people are living and what are the type of spaces that it's creating. Uh, we can see also, for example, gray is just generic, blocks. There's no real um, specific typology. Uh, so you can get a sense of how organized or mixed or varied the city is as well. Uh, you can see, for example, in the central business district, which is the historic core of Seoul, how diverse in typology it is, as opposed to, for example, Kangnam, which is mainly composed of super blocks. Right? So if you go to Kangnam, you already have an expectation of what the space will look or feel like, what type of amenities you can find there, you know, what type of living space you can find there, as opposed to if you're in the central business district or in Yoido, for example, right? So that's one initial change that I would suggest, like stop reading the city as just these uh, figure ground black spots of, of nothingness that we just get uh, quantitative data. Um, but, you know, try to get the qualitative condition as well. We can still use the island to get the quantitative data and perhaps get a much better reading of that quantitative data because the typology already has specific uh, FAR, BCR, um, number of households. We can get all of that data of the specific island. And because they're typological, if you analyze one, you not that you get the exact data of another one because it's not a mold, it's not a prototype, it's a typology, meaning that you can bend the, the project, right? The project is not gonna look the same in one block as the other, but the typology can be the same. So you can get a sense again of the, of the expected density that you'll get in different parts of the city if you know where that block is happening in different parts of the city. So the density is not uniform. Again, when you look at these aerial, area, um, sorry, the figure ground mappings of urbanity, it feels like density is just the same everywhere. Uh, but here you can get different readings of density depending on the block. 
for example, this is mapping out all of the apartment blocks in Seoul in green. So black is everything else, green is the apartment blocks. Because apartment blocks are built by brand or by year, you can also do, for example, heat maps of the apartment blocks. That already gives you a separate reading of um, quantitative data that you know, for example, here you have the reddest part, you know that those are the oldest apartments and most likely will be the ones that will get torn down next uh, to make a, the most profit for real estate development. Um, there's no, uh, I mean, lately there's been more patronage of, of trying to keep the heritage of architecture, but for the most part, every 30 years, buildings get knocked out and built new. So even just a heat map of the apartment blocks starts giving you a sense of how the city is changing. Um, where are the oldest parts in terms of that typology? What are the newest parts of that typology? And within that reading, also you get better understanding of the qualitative conditions because an apartment block built in the 1960s is gonna be different than an apartment block built in 2020. 1960s, 1970s, most of the, the, the apartment blocks would just be housing and the ground would be used for parking and that's it. Um, blocks built in the 2020s, they put the parking underground and the grounds have parks and more amenities and services and restaurants and shops on the perimeter um, and they have better construction. So there's higher density. So even understanding the block typologies can give you a further reading into the, the qualitative space and which again, I think it's a, it's a smarter way of keeping track of how the city is growing and how the city is changing. Um, we can also track for appropriations, which mainly get missed out when you do figure ground readings. Uh, this is an analysis of one specific cultural block in uh, Hongdae, which is famous for arts, music, and basically nightlife. It's a highly uh, commercial area. It's a, a highly commercial block in, in Seoul. When you look at the typical ways that you analyze a block, let's say like the parcels or the building um, figure ground so that you can get the building coverage ratio, you know, number one and number two, these are typical ways that you would map out those blocks. When you start reading the qualitative conditions of the block, you can analyze for uh, human appropriations, how humans are actually using the block, and then you find extra conditions. So in this case, there's these um, informal in-between developments. So if you see the figure ground of the buildings, this is what gets recorded to the city, the legal building that gets, like when you get a building permit, this is what you build. Um, but because this is a highly commercial area, people are using the in-between space, which are, you know, one meter slivers to build um, extra programming. Uh, sorry, this map was just showing that this is a highly commercial area. It's, it's located here and it's linked to the two lines, which brings a lot of people into the area. And because of that, the use of the in-between space has become um, highly marketable. So the city only allows 0.6 building coverage ratio, but by using the in-between space, you can get a total coverage of uh, 0.77. So you're actually gaining real estate. Uh, you're actually gaining marketable area, uh, rentable area. Right. And this is what happens in those in-between spaces. So you have these micro shops that are like one meter wide. Uh, you have informal extensions of a shop that is in the real building. So like here to the right, you have the real building, the one that gets registered to the city. And then they just use the in-between space. Um, it's not illegal, but it's not legal, let's say. Uh, so they end up using these two meter, one meter wide spaces to produce extra urbanity, right? These things do not get recorded when you do a traditional figure ground mapping 
or when you take the data, the GIS data from the city, because the GIS data from the city just gets whatever was recorded by the building permit. Um, this is something that uh, I, I still haven't implemented, but this is the next step of the research on how do you use uh, machine learning or AI to identify um, appropriations, right? Something that doesn't, doesn't doesn't get picked up on the traditional mappings of figure ground or, or these things. So for example, Tencent um, software, you can have facial recognition, which China uses to track its population. But you can program it also to track, for example, bicycles. It could recognize bicycles. It could recognize whatever you program it to, right? So you could start programming um, to recognition of appropriations and then start recognizing these extra urban plugins or extra urban conditions that get formed in specific block typologies. So if you know that this is happening in this type of block typology, you know that you probably you will find it also in the same typology somewhere else in the city. Um, and then as an architecture uh, professor, we also use it in trying to come up with new typologies that can get developed in the city, something that breaks the monotony. So for example, the apartment block, I, I've been mentioning a lot that it's very monocultural, it's just housing and it lacks a lot of amenities and services. And these are the type of developments that are happening in Seoul. For example, um, this is in the central business district. This is what is considered a uh, urban slum. They basically tear the entire block down. And again, a block is like 300 meters by 300 meters or 600 meters by 600 meters. So you're tearing down huge sections of the city to build a single development. These singular, singular developments become very monocultural, so they lack a lot of uh, extra conditions, let's say, the diversity. This is another one in Songsu. Again, you take that part that was considered slummish or let's say uh, old in, in, the, in the eyes of here, and then they just tear it all down and then we'll develop it as an apartment block typology. You can see in the background all these apartment blocks, how they look, right? They're all different brands, but it looks, it feels as everything is the same. Actually, people that come to Seoul think that these are social housing because there's so many of them. Uh, but no, they're private developments and they just follow the same formula. So we've been trying to figure out, um, are there other typologies that we can come up with? This is taking one of those entire blocks that are 600. Actually, this one was 300 meters by 300 meters. And um, we gave it to 65 students and each of the 65 students takes a little parcel inside of that 300 by 300 meters. And we try to form a low rise, high density hybrid block. So trying to come up with new typologies uh, of island, something that becomes um, highly hybrid, high, highly mixed 24 hour utility, uh, where you can live, work, and do all these things that the 15-minute city um, mandate has. Uh, we've also done, this was actually a proposal for uh, Pyongyang, North Korea, if, uh, which was to develop a micro district. Uh, micro districts also come from uh, socialist cities, but it's almost that same idea of having these autonomous compounds uh, form entire blocks. And we are looking at it in that way of how you can produce these hybrid blocks with all the amenities and services, um, really autonomous. If you're going to think about sustainability and implementing new technologies, you should think about, um, I mean, in the previous, uh, the previous speaker we talk, was talking about energy. We think about these micro districts also as micro grids how you can start producing these islands as microgrids. They should be autonomous in terms of energy production, waste management, water treatment, um, circular economies. All of that should happen within singular islands. So this was one that we would have those slab housing instead of being placed as just monotonous, um, a monotonous block, how it could form a boundary of different buildings inside of the block. So when you come inside of the block, you have these, uh, its own urban condition. 
where you can have factories, museums, offices, hotels, shops, education, um, all, all of the things that you can think of of a micro city inside of the block. So street side, you see the block, but inside you see all the diversity that happens. So it's, it's own urbanity happening inside. So my proposal, again, the next step is uh, implementing how you can use, uh, for example, AI or something like that to recognize the patterns that these typologies form. But for me, the first step is moving away from just um, thinking of city units or the idea of that you're going to try to control a city or measure a city and move more towards these conditions of subunits of urbanity and think of uh, smart islands. How can we implement everything that we know in terms of smart cities, but at the level of the block and then start producing um, really equitable spaces at the at the level of the subunit that then could could be repeated as typological islands throughout the entire um, rest of urbanity right so if we have typologies then we can track them we can quantify them we can understand the quality of space that they produce and i think that might become a smarter way of um, kind of continuing this endless urbanization that we're um, experiencing and I don't think it's going to end so might as well try to make it um, in a smarter fashion and that would be it for me okay thank you very much that was a really impressive presentation and really like futuristic probably and it's very interesting in terms of uh, all the uh, typologies uh, I'm quite familiar with Seoul I have been there so, so some of the places are really shocking <laughs> in terms of the length of the buildings and we had the joke that if for example in the uh, middle east and burj cliff like the elevator goes up and down so in asia it just goes vertically side to side <laughs> so, you know, because you need to kind of travel quickly from one yeah. building to another so that could be an option okay um do we have any questions from the audience uh, yes i have a question uh, will the use of the participation budget uh, be in the development of such small subclothes? Wait, sorry, what? I, I didn't quite get the question. Alexandra, Hello? can you repeat it? Oh, she wrote in the chat. Will the use of the participation budget be in the development of such a small um, suburban? Um, what do you mean by the participation budget? Probably there's problems with the sound. I'm assuming the question relates to uh, participation or community involvement, maybe? Participation budget. So probably that's the budget from the government, maybe? Or from municipality for developing those uh, small suburban units, islands? So, uh, I mean, a lot of these islands are built from the private sector. Um, there are social housing blocks. There are still housing blocks. So again, they're not that small. They're like 800 by 800 meters. They're 600 by 600 meters. The smallest one is like 300 by 300 meters, which if you think of it as the Barcelona Super Manzana, that's what it is. The Barcelona Super Manzana is 300 meters by 300 meters. And that's the smallest block in Seoul. So, um, each of these subunits is actually what, again, if you think of the Barcelona Super Manzana, that's what our European scale would be looking at making as a subunit. Um, so it's not a far-fetched condition of thinking of uh, community involvement and uh, public participation and these things in developing what should be uh, an island. Um, but again, for the most part, they're private developments. So from the private sector, as an architect, I would say that's what we should be thinking of. How, how do we develop new typologies? So for example, the experiment that I did at Hanyang University with the students was 
that, right? We get 65 voices and have the students go into the surrounding neighborhoods and see what's missing and do urban analysis of the, the surrounding context to see what other amenities should be um, distributed here and then produce this low rise hybrid high density block that has all of these things like school, arts, amenities, services, restaurant shops, whatever you can think of. Um, so that came out of that sort of operation or that sort of condition, um, like how can you still service the neighborhood, uh, but still form an island typology? And again, I don't, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but that's how I interpret it. Okay, then we have Dasha. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, first one, uh, you said that you, you will use artificial intelligence. I just want to know how will you use it in uh, urban? Yeah, so the what I was saying is what I'm interested in, in is trying to get qualitative data to be added to the, these analysis that... Um, so there's a lot of institutions that are trying to analyze how urbanity is growing and they keep on mapping out these figured grounds of mass, right? Like we just see this almost like a, what is it called? The ink blocks that you Get do in a psychologist. Get ground analysis. Right. So you just see these huge ink blocks and then they give you data, right? Like a, this is this much density and whatever, this is the population that lives here, but we have no idea how they live there, what are the qualitative conditions. So the first step is actually trying to understand these typological islands that form the urbanity. The next step is how are they being used? And then for that is something that I'm, I'm saying that you could use similar to facial recognition um, software to recognize different appropriations. So for example, um, in some of the low rise villa blocks, you end up getting these informal markets like movable or uh, truck markets, but they are scheduled and they have a route. Um, those sort of appropriations can be tracked by all the CCTV cameras and actually start forming mappings of where the market is going, going to move, where is it going to be, and inform the citizens uh, through apps or whatever, right? So you could end up having a better utility of the block if you know how the block is functioning. So by tracking its human appropriations, I think you can start forming more ways that the citizens or the residents can interact with how they live in the block. Um, one sort of exercise that or research that was done in a similar manner in uh, Zurich by a team called uh, TEN, which I invited them to exhibit in the Sol Biennale in 2019. They were looking at the similar condition of a block typology and trying to find underutilized spaces inside of the block that then you could somewhat programmed um, as a distributed neighborhood or as a distributed apartment. So for example, if there's a vacant space in the top of that building and another vacant space in the storefront of that building and another vacant space and somewhere else in the block, those could become shareable spaces among the residents, right? Um, again, they were, they were testing it out with uh, various conditions, rooftops, in between spaces, vacant spaces, could they become, for example, a shared library, a shared living room, a shared kitchen, a shared something like that. Uh, so again, you can track, uh, it's not necessarily AI uh, is the, the key to do it all, but you can track all the data with all the, all the tools that we have for generating data. Uh, you can track vacancies, you can track human appropriations, and you can use these to give it, again, to the residents through applications or whatever other tools that they could, you know, how they can see how to use the block better. So in that case, it was for sharing the block, right? So if you have all these vacancies, could 
somehow you sign up and go use that vacant space and make it like a Zoom room to have a conference like this for an hour, right? So at least the vacancy doesn't become permanent vacancy, it gets used. Um, we actually started doing that in Seoul within our own block um, with my firm. I mean, we rented out a space down the street that we use it as a flex space where we do um, kind of neighborhood programming and activities and interviews and Zoom calls and lectures and um, exhibitions and it's constantly rotating and then it becomes an urban living room. Um, but if people know that that exists through applications or a way of informing uh, the residents, then it becomes more useful. And, and I think more of those spaces can exist. Um, so I, I don't know, I see various ways that you can take um, all the tools that we have for generating data. If you know how the block works, you can give that data back to the citizen. Yeah, actually, uh, I agree with you, and it's a good idea, but I think maybe in the future you will have a problem because um, the data that you have is not 100% right, because as I showed us before, that uh, it should be like one or two meters distant, but someone use it, but you don't know anything about it, right, in the government. So maybe in the future we'll meet a problem like this. Not now. You're talking about it because of the government? I don't no, understand I that. The data that you have already, it's not 100% right. Maybe it's like 90%, 95%. So because I work it actually with artificial intelligence in my center work and- No, but I don't, I don't understand that the, you're saying that it could not work because the government doesn't know it? No, 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 it's not like this. I mean, uh, the system can work now, but it's not 100% right because the data that you already work on it is not 100% right. Did you get my point? Um, I think what, no, I uh, what Dasha was uh, saying that you already spotted that the data is missing of those uh, right. things that right, are- Right, but that's what I'm saying that, um, so yeah, like let's say the government has a certain set of data, which is the legal data of, for yes, example- Yes, that's what I'm talking about because building, right? specific data, right. but reality so, is something else. So yeah, but so what I'm saying is you need some other tool to figure out that informal data, which the government is not getting, right? Yes. So yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. I so, mean you so what I was saying is that uh, I mean cities like Seoul have CCTV everywhere. Um, so you could have again, kind of like facial recognition software to recognize these informal um, annexations, these informal appropriations uh that gives you that extra data that's missing oh okay then it's okay because uh because from my experience in artificial intelligence like for example if you want to do something so that it should be right for instance you 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 program the machine to learn from it so but if the data is already is not right so of course the programs that you will have it will not work right right so what i'm that's that's what I meant. Like that's why you would use the AI to try to recognize the data that's missing, right? To try to recognize those uh, missing links. Um, yeah, like those one meter shops. I think those could be recognized because it can have the real data of where the building is. Uh, we have street views and whatever all that, mm, okay. and it knows what the legal standards are of setbacks and code and all these things. And if it recognizes that there's something there that shouldn't be there, then it can track it and categorize it and can start learning to see these patterns of appropriations. So then it could start forming these new mappings of, of extra programs or extra uses that happen in the block that are not being recorded by the city or not being recorded by anybody basically. Okay, so it means that you will compare the data from the government and uh, data from uh, th that you will from make. The, yeah. Yeah, and, and then you compare it and then you see the error or the difference between them. Right, exactly. Okay, I got it. Uh, second the question, actually, I want to, uh, um, to know something because uh, here in Germany, for example, or normally in Europe, it's not common skyscrapers like uh, South Korea. And I think South mm -hmm. Korea started to have it since 1985, right? So I just want the to know first, what's, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, what's the advantage and disadvantage of skyscrapers? And did it solve really the problem for uh, accommodation? 
and economically, so, um, is it, uh, economic uh, worth it? Because you have to look from economic uh, side side also. So the the first skyscraper was in 1972. Second skyscraper was 1979. Um, and then the during the 80s, it started having big skyscrapers. And by big, I mean like the tallest one was 63 stories, um, which at the time it was the tallest one in Asia, but not like in the world. Um, because of the high level of population and density that that Korea, well, actually Seoul in specific, the high level of population that it had, that, that there was an influx of population that it got up to, you know, the metropolitan area is 25 million people. The skyscraper became a tool of density, right? So the skyscraper, you can multiply the parcel for as long as the city lets you. So it just became a tool of density. The problem is that they started having, um, the building coverage ratio, the setback code, started creating these very empty lands at the base of the skyscrapers, right? So in order to have sunlight at the street, the building has to be separated more. So when you have apartment blocks and the apartments also turn into skyscrapers that are 30 stories high, you have to separate them so that this one gets sunlight and doesn't get blocked by this one. So you end up getting like 50 meter uh, separations from one apartment building to the next apartment building in the same block. It's really, uh, I think it's a fallacy. Uh, you can have a better density with the grid in, or the typologies in Paris, for example, or Berlin, um, which are at most seven stories, but it's very uniform, very continuous. It's really using the entire uh, ground or the parcel that you get to build as much as possible, um, which actually forms a much nicer urban grid uh, than just having skyscrapers that give the fallacy of density, but then you have like really sparse conditions at the ground level. Again, you gotta, um, in, let's say the apartment block that I showed, which is in Napuyon, yeah, the, the distance from one apartment to the next apartment is like 50 meters. And then you're that's your neighbor, right? So you lose a lot of the, the idea of, of creating a community in that sense. Mm. Um, so it, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky fallacy. And I think that uh, developers use it as, as a commercial tool as well. You cannot uh, negate that everything is driven by profit as well. So if they see the pot potential for making more profit in the skyscraper, they'll just do that. Um, in terms of accommodation, uh, yeah, you cannot accommodate as much housing in a skyscraper that you can if you do the block uh, in just as a housing block in a more low rise condition or a more mid rise condition. Again, um, Paris has a much better FAR and BCR than, than, than Seoul, even though Seoul has way more skyscrapers. So I think that should give you a clue of perhaps that skyscraper theory is not the optimum for density. So mega block is more better? Uh, no, no, I think, I think, uh, I mean, these are nine typologies that are identified happening in Seoul, but I'm not saying these are the nine typologies that should be built. I'm, I'm saying we, but knowing that you can build as an island, you can propose new typology. So, you know, you could do a, a new block that has the Barcelona block, for example, or a new block that has just the Paris, uh, density. So it's like a low rise low rise, high density. And that perhaps would be more efficient than just doing skyscrapers. Because actually I see here in Germany in the future, maybe after 10 years or something like this, there will be a problem for accommodation here in Germany. So, I mean, uh, you also gotta see the, the demographics. So for example, Seoul, it's reach this peak in terms of population and it's actually looking at becoming a super aged society that will start losing population and by the year 2045 
it would have lost like a million uh, citizens inside of Seoul and the majority will be retired uh, and single. So housing is gonna become like a huge problem because the what will happen to all of these apartment blocks that are all for you know three family, uh, sorry, three bedroom family apartments, which now the target will be single people, right? Um, same is happening in Europe. And I don't know the, the specific case for Berlin, but uh, I would try to study the demographics of how that is changing in the you know 30 year span. Is it gonna stay stable? Is it gonna decrease? Is it gonna become more single, more aged? And I think all of those factors will come into effect. Uh, I mean, housing is, a, is at a crisis, I think world, the, in the whole world in terms of prices going up, lack of housing. Um, and that's why we keep on expanding and you see the urban sprawl because then you build cheaper housing outside of the city, which is more affordable. Um, but I think that's why we need to start thinking of new typologies from now. Uh, how can you start thinking of targeting that, you know, 30 year demographic, the, the, the future demographic from now? How do you start building new typologies from now? Um, but yeah, housing is at a crisis, I would say the globe over. Actually, I don't know how it is in Lithuania, but yeah, so I just okay. want a way to to kind of um, add uh, to what you were saying that yeah. probably the soul has a really strong influence from the modernist times and due to right. the political situation, which was the socialist at the same time, everyone was equal. So that's why so many, you know, those high rises were built for the families that would be equal. It doesn't matter in which district you live, but between those equal people, there was more equal people than usual, which, you know, had those different um, villas um, and, and, and like uh, old town development, uh, classical, traditional uh, civil development where they had a chance uh, either to buy or either to inherit and live there. So I think this is um, coming very far from the historical uh, periods and developments of the cities and towns. And so far that um, they're quite conservative, uh, probably I should say, uh, right? So the the uh, the first apartment block was built in 1962, and it all came from the crisis of uh, the population. So after the Korean War, there was a huge influx of population, yeah. and then during the industrial period, like even more, and it grew from like a million people to 10 million people in like a really rapid span. So the problem was how do you get housing? And what they did is they actually took the the German the Plattenbau uh, model from the 1920s and they saw this is a quick way of building fast cheap housing so do that repeat it build tons of it so they just follow the model of the typology of the Plattenbau the slab housing the the slab building and which is yeah the modernist slab housing and just multiplied it and it was all about quantity not uh, quality uh, and it rapidly grew from, uh, I think in a span of 10 years, it took over 43% of the housing in, in Seoul during the, from 1960s to 1979 or 1980s, early 1980s. Um, so in a period of a few decades, it became the model of housing. And it was all because of that rapid industrialization, rapid growth in population that just needed housing. And um, somehow they adopted that model. But there's uh, many different ways, as uh, Rafael showed you, how to get the same density with the different housing typologies. So that's only right. the way how you approach the design and how you try to create the environments, you know, and how you cleverly or creatively use all those um, housing typologies with the mix of, of different house units and as well for different society levels of the people and as well for, you know, for different family um, configurations. Uh, actually, we have the Alexandra's uh, explication. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, actually, yes. you didn't answer my questions about uh, from economy side for mega blocks. Uh, is it, does, did it make the um, accommodation more cheaper or not from economy side? Yeah. The, the super block? 
Yes, on skyscraper also. It make it more cheaper or it is the same? No. I mean, then you get into whole real estate conditions that, for example, super blocks in Kangnam, just because you are in Kangnam is way more expensive than uh, than if you were in Songsu or something like that in some other area of the city. So it just becomes a factor of the the real estate, um, the desired real estate area that you are in Seoul. So yeah, Kangnam is highly expensive and you have a villa in Kangnam compared to a villa in Songsu is going to be, I don't know, triple, quadruple in price for the same typology. So um, in that case, you couldn't compare typology to typology uh, or a skyscraper in, in, again, skyscraper in Kangnam would not be the same as skyscraper in even outside of the city in Suwon, for example, right? It's the same typology, but um, actually Incheon, which is where the airport is, uh, became a satellite city for Seoul and it has a lot of skyscrapers and apartments are quite cheap there. The same apartment, the same typology will be like a third of the price than inside Seoul. And again, depend where in Seoul, right? So the typology itself is not solving the issue of, of, uh, of the price, let's say, of affordability or marketability. Um, yeah, in that case, you, you do get into other factors of real estate. I think it's more beneficial for the developer to, to have yeah, the whatever's cheaper, more beneficial, cheaper whatever cost makes more for money building for and selling at the higher price. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a small parcel, you'll try to build a skyscraper so you can sell more units, basically. So it's it's not really. And then if you're in Kangnam, you can sell them much more expensive. So it doesn't really matter if you're a skyscraper or not. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. We have Alexandra's explanation of what she meant. Uh, she says, uh, I meant the residents can decide on the development, uh, what they need in such a, a small suburban areas. The participatory budget allows residents to submit their ideas in the city so, space. Uh, so, in so I, sorry, I'm actually, <laughs> that's how it works. Uh, okay. So, so, the way that the I said the apartment blocks work. I said that it, they change every 30, every 30 years. They work as a community. They form a co-op. Uh, all the residents are part of this co-op. So it's, it's almost like a corporation, an entity. And they submit a plan to the city that they want to develop their block. So all the residents of one block are part of the voice of how the block should be developed. Of course, the residents are not architects or real estate developers or builders. So then they hire whatever builder, contractor, or developer they think, and it becomes the same development as somewhere else. So all the concerns of the citizen and the voice and all of these things kind of just become another real estate condition. Uh, but it starts just like that. It starts as a co-op of the residents coming together and forming a group and uh, putting their voice to the city and saying, we want to develop our block and we want this and that. And this is how, and there's a lot of hearings and actually it takes quite a while to redevelop a block because of all the voices. Um, but yeah, at the end, it becomes just another apartment block development and it becomes a profitability condition, so. Yeah. So thank you, Rafael, very much. Uh, I know it's quite early <laughs> back there where you live now. So um, if we don't yep. have any questions, so we can let Rafael to rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, so probably no questions. Okay, Rafael, okay. thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. I'll oh, talk to you later. Such. Okay, see ya. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so thank you everyone for this uh, morning session. So we will have the break and we're actually behind the schedule. So we're supposed to meet at uh, half past two.
in Central European time. So maybe let's give extra 10 minutes uh, so we can have a proper uh, lunch for everyone and we will meet back here. Okay, I'll see you then.